like to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. This week, we look at Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14, the account of the Valley of Dry Bones. As we often do on Wednesday nights when we're able to gather physically in the same room, this week's scripture is also the text for this coming Sunday sermon. Studying the same text allows us to look at background, dig deeper on some issues than we might be able to do on Sunday morning, hopefully giving us a larger context and fuller understanding of the scripture, uh, which enlarges our the meaning for us individually and as a church family. So today I'd like to uh, look at some history that leads up to uh, the time of the prophet Ezekiel and his work uh, among his people. Remind you of some of the kings in the early days of Israel, and we're going back hundreds of years uh, prior to Ezekiel. Saul was the first king. He was followed by David, the great warrior king, who expanded the um, boundaries of the kingdom and brought great uh, attention uh, to Israel. He was followed by his son, Solomon, who was a great administrator, great builder. He built the first temple in Jerusalem. He was able to continue the expansion of the kingdom, and Israel was solidified as a regional power at that time. After Solomon's death, there was conflict among the tribes, especially between the 10 tribes of the north and the two tribes of the south. Some of the reasons for the conflict involved taxation and the forced labor that uh, people had to endure in order to support the ministry or the administration of uh, the king. The result of this conflict, civil war actually, was two nations merged where they had been once one. The 10 tribes of the north maintained the name of Israel, and the southern tribes took the name of the predominant tribe, Judah. So now we have two nations, both much smaller than the original one nation, and both of them were under the influence beginning from the very early days of the divided kingdom, both of them were under the increasingly strong influence of the Assyrian Empire, which began to come into its own about the same time of the divided kingdom's beginning. Assyria, their empire eventually stretched from modern day Iraq all the way around to Egypt. And so understanding the geography of that region because of this expansion it was inevitable that both Israel and Judah would be influenced greatly by the Assyrians. Both of them eventually uh, came to be under the sway of the powerful Assyrians. Uh, as siblings are wont to do, while the northern and southern kingdoms coexisted for about 200 years, there was an ongoing hostility between them. Many times they came uh, to blows. So they, they had wars between them. And the result of the last war between the northern and the southern kingdom uh, was that the northern kingdom sided with one of their neighbors and Judah sided with Assyria, whose forces had come in to put down uh, rebellion. Uh, Assyria won, being the stronger of the military uh, powers. Assyria won. Judah was able to maintain its status as an independent nation, though moving forward, they became virtually a vassal state of the Assyrians, continuing to pay heavy tribute. The Northern Kingdom, this is uh, and in 722, the Northern Kingdom fell to the Assyrians uh, because of their military loss. The territory of the 10 tribes was, was absorbed into the Assyrian Empire, and many of the leading people of, the, uh, of, of Israel were deported by the Assyrians. For the next 
100 years, the southern kingdom, Judah, uh, practiced a certain amount of independence, but they continued to be under the influence of the superpower of the day, which had changed. Uh, the Assyrians uh, lost out to the Babylonians, and that's another story that does not hold our attention tonight. It's an interesting historical story how the Babylonians uh, took over the Assyrian Empire. There were significant religious overtones in this takeover, if you want to go and read that sometime. But the, the Babylonians took over the Assyrian Empire and began to exert influence uh, over the whole territory that the Assyrians had once controlled. This meant Judah is now under the influence of Babylonia uh, or of Babylon, and they pushed back against this from time to time. The result was that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, uh, or of the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar on several occasions brought troops uh, to Jerusalem or to Judah, usually ending up in Jerusalem. And there were a number of campaigns against Judah, uh, each of them resulting in deportations. Uh, the first deportation was in 597. Uh, again, 10 years later in 587, the, the Babylonians returned. Uh, in 587, uh, they destroyed most of the city of Jerusalem, including the destruction of the temple and the looting of all of the uh, valuable parts of the temple and taking them back with them uh, to Babylon. They returned again in 582, 581, and even took more people at that time. Uh, Ezekiel, the prophet whose work we consider tonight was part of that first deportation in 597 BC. He and his wife were taken to Babylon and it was there that he carried out his ministry and the work that we are looking at tonight and again on Sunday. Uh, Ezekiel was a contemporary of Jeremiah, uh, the prophet, another prophet. And there were numerous prophets in this time, many of them unnamed. All of them are the true prophets, all of them seeking to give out the word of God. But Ezekiel and Jeremiah are two of this time that we know a significant, um, we have a significant amount of information about their ministries and we have collections of their sermons and their other actions in their attempt to get the message of God to the people. Jeremiah and Ezekiel differed in that Ezekiel was a part of that first deportation to Babylon. And so his ministry took place among the exiled people, those who had been taken uh, to Babylon and his ministry was directed toward them. They were on the sidelines now uh, watching from a distance what was going on in their homeland. Jeremiah was not deported, and his ministry took place in and around Jerusalem until he was forced by a group of war refugees after that uh, last Assyrian, or at the time of that last Assyrian uh, incursion, he was forced by a group of war refugees to go with them uh, to Egypt, where he continued uh, his ministry and his preaching. Ezekiel, like Jeremiah, uh, preached judgment uh, and hope. Uh, Ezekiel received his prophetic call in 593. He prophesied between 593 and 571. We know these dates because there are 13 very specific dates given uh, in the book, and there's a, a chronological order to his messages. And so we don't always see that in the other uh, books of prophecy, but Ezekiel's is laid out uh, from beginning to end in chronological order. The Ezekiel warned his fellow exiles, remember Ezekiel is in Babylon. He warned them uh, that Jerusalem would not be spared after the 597 incursion when Jerusalem did not fall, 
when there was uh, allowed to remain in place by the Babylonians, Jerusalem and Judah were allowed to remain in place as an intact um, nation, if you will, though heavily influenced by Babylon at this point. The exiles looking on from a distance were convinced that because the temple was still standing, that Judah would survive, that Jerusalem would stand, that the temple would always be there. Not so, uh, said Ezekiel, uh, as portrayed in his visions, the visions that God gave to Ezekiel, the glory of God had departed from the city. It was now vulnerable to destruction. Uh, Judah had rebelled against God not so much against uh, Babylon. That was not God's concern. Judah had rebelled against God. And you have to read the the history of that period to see all of the ways in which Judah had rebelled. Uh, idolatry was one of the big things. Judah would pay for its rebellion, Ezekiel preaches. However, as we get to the last section of Ezekiel's preaching, we see that God promises through Ezekiel that God would eventually restore the people to the land and would establish or reestablish pure worship in a new temple. Uh, Ezekiel carried out the message or put, put out the message of judgment and of hope in many different ways. There were prophetic visions. There were symbolic acts. He, he gave parables and, of course, preached messages of both judgment and salvation. Uh, the book of Ezekiel is broken easily into three parts, or we can three, see three sections. The first section, chapters 1 through 24, were focused on the approaching fall of Jerusalem, which happened uh, in 582. Chapters 25 through 32 prophesy judgment upon the surrounding nations, those nations that surrounded Judah. And then chapters 33 through 48 in which uh, this week's passage stands, there we find pictures of the miraculous restoration of the nation and the system of worship that the nation carried out. Like many of the prophets who preceded him, uh, Ezekiel uh, denounced God's people for their sins, and he warned them that judgment was coming. Now, Ezekiel was out of a priestly background, so as a priest, uh, he was very uh, familiar with the temple and very devoted to the worship that went on in the temple. And so in in one vision, he saw the glory of God leaving the temple, the polluted temple, and abandoning the defiled city. Imagine the exiles' despair hearing Ezekiel tell of this vision, understanding that their beloved city and their beautiful temple were no longer blessed by God. And through speeches and symbolic acts and, and parables, Ezekiel prophesied that the city would fall to the Babylonians and then there would be more people exiled. But now God's judgment would not be limited just to those people. He would also punish surrounding uh, hostile nations, nations that had been hostile to Judah. He would punish them especially Tyre, uh, and Egypt. But Ezekiel's messages held out hope, though God's people were scattered in exile. God had not abandoned them. He would miraculously restore them to their land. He would reunite Israel and Judah in a, uh, under a new ideal Davidic ruler, uh, and he would establish uh, peace with them and annihilate their enemies. Uh, Ezekiel prophecy ends with this idealized vision uh, of a new and purified temple, and out of that temple would flow a life-giving uh, river. To understand Ezekiel, uh, the man, a bit better, we go back into the early chapters of Ezekiel and see his commissioning. That begins in the first part of chapter two, uh, the Lord lifted Ezekiel up and commissioned him as a messenger to uh, Israel who was in rebellion. Now, Israel, not the, not the nation, not the northern 
tribes which had already departed from the scene, but but Israel as the people of God. God encouraged Ezekiel not to fear, even in the face of a great deal of hostility and danger. He was to proclaim God's word no matter how the people responded. And God symbolized his commission by instructing Ezekiel to eat a scroll which contained some of the words of judgment. God promised to give Ezekiel determination, perseverance, and boldness, the kind of things he would need to stand up to his hostile, obstinate audience. Now, after uh, Ezekiel encountered the Lord, the Spirit of God led Ezekiel uh, to the community in exile in Babylon, and he sat there in stunned silence for a week. Uh, The Lord called him to be a watchman for the people. He was responsible to warn the people of God's impending judgment. Ezekiel was to warn the wicked and also those who are righteous, for there were still righteous people, but they might have been tempted to backslide. And God told Ezekiel if he failed to warn the people as God instructed him to do, their blood, which would be shed in judgment, their blood would be on Ezekiel's head. But then something I'm sure Ezekiel thought of as strange. As soon as the commission was delivered, God placed heavy restrictions on how Ezekiel could deliver it. He could not just give these messages of warning whenever and however he desired. God instructed him to enter his house. He would remain confined there and he would be incapable of speech. He could only leave his house to speak or to speak when when specifically directed by the God by God to do so. And these restrictions were an object lesson uh, to God's people that their rebellion was making it increasingly difficult for God to communicate to them. Some personal notes about Ezekiel. Apparently, his home was a center for much of his ministry. Uh, at times, the people were directed or leaders were directed to go to Ezekiel's house, and there they would hear the word uh, from the Lord. Uh, his wife and he maintained a private home near a the Great Canal in Babylon. Uh, and his wife, as God describes her in Ezekiel 24, 16, his wife was the delight of his eyes. But that passage also uh, carried a very somber note for Ezekiel, for there God told him, uh, warned him that the two greatest tragedies of his life would happen on the same day, the death of his wife and the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, This in Ezekiel 24, beginning in verses 15, or in verse 15 and following, you can read uh, this, this prophecy from God to Ezekiel. Uh, We don't know a lot else of his personal life other than what is revealed in the messages that he delivered and the way he delivered them. Uh, He was both a a fiery uh, evangelist, but also a a tender pastor. He pronounced judgment and he proclaimed hope, uh, hope that would bind up the brokenhearted. Uh, One of Ezekiel's best known visions is found in Ezekiel uh, chapter 37. This is the Valley of uh, Dry Bones, uh, and it holds a picture that would bring hope of restoration for a broken people. This is the text for Sunday's sermon. I hope this background material will be helpful to you as you prayerfully prepare for uh, worship together separately. Uh, And as we look forward to seeing how God speaks to us uh, through this ancient picture, Uh, there's no test on the information uh, that I've tried to give you today. But understanding this context hopefully helps make what we will see in Ezekiel 37 uh, more understandable to us, more meaningful to us and allow us to be in a better place to let God speak to us. So I look forward to seeing you as we gather together electronically Sunday morning. And until then, I am your pastor and your friend. If I can help you in any way as we navigate our way through 
uh, this self-imposed exile or isolation, uh, please call on me.